Welcome everyone to today's webinar titled Intelligent Automation Readiness, Shaping Best Practices for Your Organization. It's being sponsored today by our partner, Episoft. Um, a little bit of background about the uh, Institute for Robotic Process and Automation. Uh, it's a uh, independent professional association and knowledge forum for buyers, sellers, influencers, and analysts of the overall robotic process automation space. The services include networking and uh, training events and webinars such as today, as well as software selection, advisory, sponsorship, staffing and recruiting, and additional content delivery. Today's speakers will be myself, Rohil Khan. I'm the president of Digital Services Exchange Solution within the ERPA organization. Uh, I have about 25 years of industry experience in the outsourcing and automation space. Joining me today will be two additional industry experts, uh, Carl Hillier and Raman Makkar. Why don't I turn it over to you, Carl, and let you do a quick introduction, and then over to you, Raman, after that. Sure. Thanks, Rohel. My name is Carl Hillier. I'm the head of product marketing here at Episoft. Uh, like Rohel, I have about 25 uh, years' worth of experience in the ECM and uh, BPM spaces, and um, I'm look forward, looking forward to this discussion. Hi, and I'm Raman Makkar. Um, I've been working in the IT industry now for about 30 years. I was originally trained as an industrial engineer and a computer scientist, so over time I got to sort of bring those two together uh, and actually work on process automation and then uh, machine learning, AI, and overall automation with RPA. Um, most of my time goes in solutioning for the peculiar cases that our clients come up with. So hopefully I'll I'll be able to do justice to this. Back to you, Rohail. Sorry about that. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing is that our customers that we work with are struggling and figuring out how to start in the automation process and where they fit in. Maybe, Carl, we can start with you uh, and, and have you describe some of the baselines that companies are, are looking at, both from a different size and a maturity level perspective. Sure. Um, well, this problem really isn't anything new. Um, you know, automation has been around for a very long time. Uh, certainly when I got involved in the industry back in the 90s, you know, it was called workflow back then. And, and organizations, you know, recognize they have a problem uh, in, in, in the way that their business processes operate. And, and where to start, you know, particularly when you're, you're not even sure where the problem really lies. You know that you're not doing well enough, but you don't necessarily know uh, where the problems regard. So there's there's, there's an, a number of different options available to organizations. Some go down the anal analytics route where they actually go look at their processes and analyze and try and identify whether it's process bottlenecks or particularly expensive parts of the process. But where to start? You know, you, you don't necessarily want to um, have this grandiose plan. Um, very often what you want to do is build build momentum within the organization and get an executive buy-in. And the best way to do that is to go after a, a particularly accessible benefit, whether it's you know a low-hanging fruit, something that ideally uh, you know has a direct correlation to the customer experience. Because you know in today's age, it's all all about the the total customer experience is how you differentiate. It's not necessarily having the lowest mortgage rate. Or, or the best interest rate uh, from a banking standpoint. A lot of it is about customer experience. So organizations very often see a, see a significant benefit in identifying particular areas of their business where if they can improve the way they operate, that can directly correlate to a benefit to the customer, which ultimately will uh, lead to a benefit for them as well. As far as different sizes of companies, again, this is a, a challenge that you know is, is Posed to organizations, be they small or be they, you know, some of the largest banks in in, in the world, uh, and it's a real challenge. Certainly, some advances in the world of uh, in the world regarding a, a cloud-based deployment certainly opens up the ability to leverage technology um, that was hitherto 
smaller organizations. So certainly today, compared to maybe 20 years ago, allows smaller organizations to leverage some of this technology as well. I completely agree with you, Carl. I think when I, when I look at this problem overall, and when I, I see clients who either think, oops, we missed the train, we missed the automation AI train, or we caught the train, but somebody else is driving it, and we're not quite sure what the destination is, right? The direction and the outcomes, they give me some benefit as an organization, but ultimately it's maybe a vendor who's driving my automation, and the, the places where they're driving the automation is whatever's written in their contract gets them the most money. Or then there are other organizations who look at it and say, hey, um, I'm firmly in control, I'm on the train, I'm driving it, I know where I started from, I know where I'm headed, right? In any of those cases, you, you look at it and go, uh, most organizations look at it and go, well, we're on the train, and there's, there's this temptation to almost jump in and start immediately without really planning. What, what I typically call, you know, ready, fire, aim, instead of ready, aim, fire, right? So shooting from the hip, if you want to call it that. And, and that leads to a whole range of issues. But most organizations that I've seen jump into, other than a few who've been fairly, fairly planful about it, have, have suffered from that approach of shooting from the hip. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I think one of the things as we go to the, ne the next question, maybe Roman, we can, we can take this uh, and, and direct it to you because I think it actually is related to the last line in particular is, what are some of the practical steps when considering, uh, uh, you know, a BPO or um, uh, an RPA effort? What, what steps should organizations take in terms of, you know, getting on the train as you referenced? Yeah, so, you know, if, if you just step back from the question and ask yourself, whether you're doing outsourcing, meaning traditional BPO, or uh, and whether that was you know onshore, offshore, nearshore, or whatever whatever shore you shore you want to call it, or you're doing automation, which is, which you could call no shore for no shore for the lack of a better term, it's a journey, and every journey has a starting point. It has a set of milestones that you measure against and say, hey, this is far, how far I've come, and this is how far I've left to go. And you have, at least initially, you have a set of goals, a, a target or, or a destination that you want to get to, right? Now, problem is, if you don't know where you're starting from or where you're headed, you're essentially lost. You had, at that point, you might as well have a blindfold on your eyes and you might as well, as, as well be throwing darts at something and hope it hits something, right? Um, so if you ask me, what are the key steps that need to be there? Well, you need to know your goals. What are your goals? Are they related to cost? Are they related to quality? Are they related to scale? Or is that is there a mix of some of those or more uh, parameters that you're looking at? Are those short term, medium term, long term? You you got you got to be able to break these goals out, right? And then you you got to know, okay, I know where I want to go. That's my destination, at least in the in the in the sort of immediate term that I, as I framed it. I need to know where I am. So I can lay out a path to go from where I am to where I want to go, right? So once you have your current, once you, once you understand where you are, and that you can that you define by saying, let me map out my processes. Let me get uh, an idea of what my process metrics or operational metrics look like. So I know what's costing me money, which processes are working, which processes aren't working, what parts of those processes aren't working. Right. So in essence, you're breaking it down. You're breaking it down to smaller components, you know, bite, small bites, digestible chunks, and, and you're moving forward with that. Now, once you've understood what your process metrics are, the one common thing, the theme that runs across everything else is communication, communication, communication. I mean, anytime you bring in something as large as automation or, you know, enterprise level outsourcing, Unless your organizational culture is structured a certain way, unless you have that strain in the DNA that says, hey, we are okay with moving from doing this myself to giving it to somebody and supervising and managing that work, or letting some automated bot actually run with it in, in places where this is 
work that can that that is sort of repeatable that that can be handled by a bot it it's that underlying dna strain strain of dna that says culturally we are adaptable and we're okay with that and we're okay with stepping to more value added tasks than keeping control of all the minutiae and doing all the smaller steps ourselves that again if if you look at those those some of those steps they they define what is it that you need to do whether you you know going in for traditional bpo or rpa yeah raman said something really important there and he talked about goals uh, and he did make reference to a destination but only in so far as having an idea of your destination when you start a destination is not an end point in the sense that we get to the end of, the, of this implementation and we can say, hey, are we great? We've, we've, we've done a fantastic job and we can walk away. It's, it's a, a continually moving target. So one of the most important steps is remembering that this is an ongoing process. It's not something that is, has a conventional kind of project mentality where you have a start point and you have an end point. Uh, and I think that's something that you know is is something that we'll obviously discuss as we as we go through this uh, webinar. That you have to be adaptable to change. That what you think you want at the outset, your goals are going to be fairly well defined. But exactly how you get there and where you'll be when you meet those goals, that's something that will change over time. And you have to be flexible enough to embrace that. I think that's an extremely important point, Carl. And I think the the idea here is it's not static. It's a living, breathing requirement within organizations to continue to evolve. And I think that, that kind of ties into the, the, the next question. Maybe, Carl, I'll direct it to you. But at, at the baseline, we've seen that there's a major evolution uh, you know, of workflow automation into more of a holistic business process management focus. Um, can you kind of describe uh, where, where you think we are today on that continuum? and, and uh, you have a view, and I'd be interested in views you may have in terms of industries and or functional areas that are incorporating more of a BPM focus into their organizational execution. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I, like I said, I've been in the BPM space since the, since the early 1990s. Uh, and I think probably looking back, you know, taking an overview of the last couple of decades, certainly one of the biggest trends recently and where we are now compared to where we were is that if you look at workflow as it evolved into BPM and, and, and became much more of a, uh, an embracing of a number of um, complementary technologies, the shift now in the market is that organizations are looking for solutions built upon BPM rather than saying, I want to buy a bucket load of BPM and build a custom solution. People are looking for something that's delivering benefits much more quickly uh, using best practices. Um, and I think if you look at you know the, the the drive towards digital transformation and the look you look at technologies like BPM and RPA, they have an insatiable appetite for data. And obviously, the hallmark of digital transformation is taking information that is in analog form, in the form in a lot of cases of documents, uh, and digitizing that. But I don't mean dig digitizing the document in the sense of I'm going to create a, a PDF or a JPEG image of a document that I can view on a screen, which is really where we were in the early 1990s with the advent of document imaging. But more than that, we want to extract the tangible business content from inside of those documents and digitize that into a structured data format that then can be leveraged digitally inside of BPM and RPA. And if you look at the industries in where this is deployed, there is no real kind of one industry. It's, it's very much a cross section, much like Eversoft's customer base. You know, we, we deal with banks, insurance companies, government institutions, healthcare, tra transportation, and logistics. There really isn't a, a business operation today that doesn't benefit from this type of technology. And and uh, like I said. There's a move towards a much more solution oriented approach. So, for example, one of the one of the most recent releases that we've we've done with 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 Eversoft Transact is released a, an offering called Transact for Mortgage, which is specifically designed for the mortgage industry. Where one of the challenges is that you've got all of these hundreds and hundreds of different document types. Uh, and previously, we had we have customers that have implemented Transact in the past, and they've done a fabulous job at automatically um, classifying document types from a wide variety of different sources. 
Now, what Transact for Mortgage does is actually automatically out of the box uh, distinguish between over 600 different document types. Now, why is that important? Well, it significantly reduces the implementation costs, so we reckon it saves somewhere in the order of about a 1,000 hours of consulting and reduces the costs and the time it takes to implement those kinds of solutions. So you know, what we're seeing is that this is being applied right across the board. I think one of the biggest challenges is for organizations to come up uh, to be able to find solutions that are addressing their particular more uh, their particular vertical industry, rather than having to try and build things from scratch as they a, they did probably uh, five to ten years ago. Completely, completely agree with you, Carl. I mean, whether that's digitization, whether that's case management, whether that's business transformation, the one common theme running through all BPM solutions and structured to the specific needs of of an industry uh, is continuous process improvement. It's it's the ability to sort of have a, a beginning point of a journey, define your milestones, get to what you, as you're progressing towards this, reevaluate where you're headed and look at the numbers, look at the metrics, and again, set a new goal, change direction. And in some cases, that change in direction is marginal. In other cases, it's significant as data tells you a whole different story. So it, it's all about the continuous process improvement. Yeah, clearly some themes are starting to emerge here, right, in terms of a more holistic approach, a more end-to-end -end viewpoint, and more of a journey that continues to evolve. Uh, and maybe to that end, uh, maybe Raman, I'll get your thoughts on this one. You know, how would you recommend organizations go about Im implementing this continuous improvement framework that you referenced? Again, stepping back from that question a little bit, right, um, you look at implementing continuous improvement and that's that's got to be implemented in a process right now before you go about doing anything dras as drastic as hey i'm going to automate something or i'm going to implement some technology on, on on something the first step you always you've always got to do is evaluate what you've got right how much of that and how much of that is truly useful today how much of that could be done differently so just think about it um, over the 30 years that I've worked in different organizations, as I was starting out, most of my onboarding was all about, Raman, go, go talk to Carl. He's going to tell you how to do this job, right? And Carl himself had joined about two years ago. Somebody else taught him that. And he added his own little personalized flavor of how that job needed to be done. So as more and more people got trained, the core process, that, which was at some point established by somebody, evolved and changed in some cases for the better in other cases purely based on whims and fancies right so at some point you got to step back and evaluate and say how much of this process really applies which steps are redundant now which steps are can be improved further can be changed or something can be done with them to make them better and then again measure and say hey is this did this change actually make it better and if it did I've got a new standard baseline. Let, let me now go in and automate this, right? Now, that's sort of the, the almost like the beginning, the starting point of that. So as you've, as you've, as you've done that, as you analyze the process, and you've, you know, uh, and, and what do you analyze the process based on? It's a, it again goes back to all the things that Carl talked about. Data is a key element. And how do you capture data? How do you go about it? You know, grabbing that information that will give you that, that, that knowledge and that intelligence that lets you move forward in a direction. And how do you do that in a cost-effective manner? Because in the old days, as an industrial engineer, they would send me out to the, to the shop floor with, with a stop clock and, a, and a, sort of a, a chart in my hand and say, go measure how much each step is taking and how much the movement of some certain materials from machine station one to machine station two and so on is taking. Right, you did that uh, that discrete sort of analysis once every couple of years, and and then you know let the process run. You don't have you know, and a that's expensive, and b processes and industries now are changing very rapidly. So you don't have the luxury of doing a discrete analysis at some point and waiting for two years to find out is this still the same. You could have had mergers and acquisitions. You could have had 
market in market conditions changed because of which you, you needed to implement something in a more agile manner. So you have to have a way of capturing this information automatically without intrusively requiring a person to go in and sort of note down, hey, what is each step taking? Because I remember the shop, the workers on the shop floor, when they saw me coming, hey, they knew my recordings would determine what their new throughput or output goals would be for the next so many for the next so many months. So that was an output that could be manipulated. I mean, the people could slow down and give me any any kind of reasons, right? So imagine putting a probe or a or a process discovery bot on every machine that's that's running. And this process discovery bot is now capturing all the information that's that's being fed into this computer, each step that's being carried out by the human being, each application that you're going to, uh, this human being is going to, and, and pulling information from and interacting with it and sort of transforming it. Now, all of that today is possible with these process discovery bots, right? You can capture all that information. You can even draw automatically based on common patterns, common trends, and, and sort of grouping them together, uh, draw out these process maps automatically. It, it takes maybe two to three days of capturing all that information across a bunch of people to actually draw out a fairly good process map. Although if you do it just for two or three days, uh, it, it's likely that you've only captured the, the happy flow right? Not the exception flows, not that something went bump in the night. So in case there are trends within your, trends within your business, you know, something happens once a week or there's a, week, there's a month end set of transactions that are different or a quarter end or a year end that's different, then it makes sense to sort of structure this data capture, at least in the initial run, to, to fit that need, to, to understand what the exceptions are. Once you've got this information, now you analyze the data and say, hey, I'm going to do away with these, these steps of the process. I'm going to optimize these, and I'm going to automate these. And then measure again. And after you've measured, you're back to the starting point, right? So there is a continuous flow that starts with the initial capture of unobtrusively capturing the initial bits of data and then going through all of this to come back to capturing data for, for the now modified set of processes to continue this process. Yeah, and I think one of the key things again that um, Ramal mentioned was was the idea of training, and and training also ha has an uh, a, a, an implement implementation at the AI level and machine learning level. So when we talk about continuous improvement, in an ideal world, we want the system to become more efficient, more 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 accurate, uh, and certainly from an FSOF standpoint with Transact, we do that through the training of the system, so that as and when human beings make corrections that we are able to feed that back into the into the loop so that the system becomes more and more accurate or you have a situation where you're dealing with documents that change on a regular basis so if you look at something like accounts payable for example you're going to have vendors that suddenly change the format in which they they provide their invoices or you're going to onboard new vendors with new invoice formats and you don't want to have to have a huge amount of manual effort in adapting to that change. You want to embrace that change so that the system automatically adapts and continually delivers a high level of accuracy or indeed ideally improves its accuracy over time, therefore making the system more efficient, more, uh, making the automation that much more compelling from the standpoint of speed in terms of accuracy and in terms of the overall cost. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And, and maybe that's a nice transition to the next question. Maybe, Carl, I'll direct that to you, is in terms of, you know, as you look across your, your customer base, what are some of the trends or, the, or, or the, the best practices that you're seeing start to emerge? And are there any use cases that you might be able to share? Well, I think when you, when you look at the types of business processes that organizations are trying to automate, um, because you're able to do things in a, in, a, in a way that would not be possible in a manual world, it allows you to view those types of business processes in a different light. If you take something, again, like accounts payable, you know, you've got organizations, we had an organization, Honda Logistics, that was processing you know, 120,000 uh, invoices a year, and, they were, and they're able to do that now with just two staff. And in fact, you know, it used to be the case where you know, it, they, were, they were processing documents coming in, 
and, and, it, and it was taking an inordinate amount of time to, to enter those invoices into the system. So for example, prior to the deployment of the system, it would take them potentially you know, up to 90 days. So some invoices were going unpaid because they hadn't been entered into the system. Now, through this, the automated system with Transact, they're able to get these invoices validated within 48 hours. And more importantly, they're pulling all this valuable information off these invoices, which gives them an insight and creates a level of transparency that allows them to treat those invoices in a completely different way. So because now they have the transparency of the information, they can actually manage their cash flow more efficiently. They can use the data that they've got to then negotiate with vendors to get deep discounts. So what they've done is, to all intents and purposes, they they've turned their AP department actually into a profit center where they can actually generate revenue because they're able to, as opposed to, you know, take advantage of early payment discounts and things like that, which up until that point, they've had no visibility into whatsoever. Uh, and then you look at, you know, other organizations such as the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and in their particular case, what they were dealing with was a real problem with either fraud or in, in, in improper payments, and it was a significant challenge. They reckon it was about 12.1%, uh, which represented about $43 billion in payments. And you know, through a variety of impl uh, a variety of uh, advances in automation, of which certainly Effersoft was a, was a part, they lowered that from 12.1 to 10 percent. Now that doesn't sound a whole lot, but actually that two percent reduction result is actually works out at about seven billion dollars, uh, which is a very significant amount of money in anyone's. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with government, people tend to kind of write off small amounts, but seven billion dollars is big, no matter who you are. Uh, and I think that you know they were able to do um, such great work with that, and, and most importantly, you know it's all very well saving a whole bunch of money, but they but they actually reckon that they returned about five dollars for every uh, dollar that they invested in that project. So again, yes, it costs money, and even you know people think, well, is is something like accounts payable or fraud detection? It's not generating more revenue, but actually it is because it it, it translates directly to the balance sheet. Whether you're in the private or the public sector, doing your processes more efficiently, getting rid of waste, um, more more uh, optimally utilizing your resources, so being able to you know reallocate um, human capital to to more revenue generating activity has a significant benefit as well. Absolutely, I'm, I'm completely agree with uh, Carl. Now, um, I'll pick one of the examples that Carl was giving was again processing invoices. Well, typically when you're processing invoices, bills relating purchase orders, and, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff, what, what you get is this large blob of documents that's all merged into one, where traditionally what, what organizations would do is they'd put somebody manually to sort of separate out, logically separate each of those documents and classify them. Well, the fact that machine learning can recognize patterns, the fact that you can you now have but multimodal, bidirectional, uh, character level neural networks that can recognize the terms and the context of the phrases used on each one of them, you have the ability to sort of very, you know, with a high degree of certainty, recognize that a document is a certain type of document, that an invoice, despite all the different types of invoices that exist for every organization, is an invoice or a, a lease contract or a lease contract or something else is a certain type of document. Now, as much as that's saving money, the fact that you're building a neural network, the fact that you're creating this underlying sort of repository, universal repository of, of information is useful because you're building that knowledge and that applies, not just for the invoices, but tomorrow a new type of document comes in. If nothing else, it says, I don't recognize this specific type of document, and it's not, it's not the, your systems or your pe people are not giving you a false positive saying, hey, it is a certain type of document when it's not. So there is, a, as much as there's a cost aspect to it, the fact that you're building this, it, it's almost like, think, think about it from the perspective of a little child growing up, right? A little child at childhood has a brain that's had certain number of, certain amount of input, and it's, it's developed, it's stretched a little bit, the neural pathways have developed a little bit. As the exposure grows, that knowledge grows, and that knowledge is then used to, you know, solve, hopefully tomorrow, world hunger. <laughs> but in essence, 
it's that growth of that knowledge. It's that universal, you know, information base that 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 you've started building now. That's growing, and that will always be useful. Yeah, that's 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 quite effective, and actually, I think it it trends very nicely into um, the the next the next piece that I wanted to talk about. And maybe Roman, we'll start with you. You know, as as, as we've looked across the spectrum within which organizations are executing today in the automation and the BPM space, they were some very early movers that, that were jumping way ahead, right? And, and I think one of the things that we're seeing in those conversations with those early movers is that the total cost of ownership is actually higher than what they expected. It's actually the reverse of what they thought they were going to, to, to experience. What do, you think that's, what do you think is causing that? And, and what, could be the, what could they be doing differently to kind of address that that outcome and 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 get them on a different path. Absolutely, I'm going to tell, think about. It. I mean, there, there's a slight nuance there. If if somebody st stepped out to say step one of the process needs to be executed quicker, and hey, I don't need to worry about my processor falling sick or taking a day off, you know, they'd be right in saying, hey, here's something that works 24 by 7 and always processes that that specific element the same way. So the chance of the defects coming up are low and, and you're getting a higher throughput. What happens? Like anything else in life, processes change. Something else gets modified a little bit. Or going back to the earlier discussion that we were having, somebody jumped into the implementation of automation in that same old, you know, let me fire from the hip. Ready, fire, aim. You know, so purely from that perspective, Jumping in and not realizing that you, you're probably uh, automating something that's not working right and it's leading, to, leading you to a bad result is something that a lot of organizations have found out the hard way. So some of these cases in the, with the early implementers were, was, was a, it, the use case was essentially they got uh, an order from up above from the, from the, um, you know, from, from the C-suite and it said, hey, thou shalt automate. And folks essentially jumped in and said, hey, here's something that looks meaningful. Let me jump in and get this automated. Now, as is, as we talked about earlier, some processes may, may have needed some sort of culling, some cleaning up. That didn't happen. So you, you took a bad process and you automated it. Now, even as you automated it, the process has changed. Even if you pick the right, the right sort of processes to automate, the process changed. And the way the early implementations happened for automation, folks weren't really thinking about the changing processes and what impact it would have on maintaining the automation. So the concept of adaptive automation hadn't come in. The fact that a lot of that adaptiveness should be and can be built into the ancillary systems so that you can keep your pure automation from an RPA perspective clean and running a certain way, folks hadn't hadn't really thought through that. So which level should the changes typically go into? Are the changes going to be accommodated within a larger framework that's able to detect where the problems, where the problems are occurring as opposed to trying to figure out post facto, hey, something went wrong, let me go figure out what, right? Now, in the traditional software world, we, we always put in, you know, error detection routines where if something went wrong, you got, even if it was a cryptic message, you got a hint of where the problem was and you went and found it, right? In the, in the rush to automation, a lot of that didn't really happen. We, we sort of forgot our basic principles, in a manner of speaking. So a lot of that is, is what led to, you know, poor uh, total cost of ownership, whether that was jumping in with processes that weren't ready without really realizing that some processes should not be automated or others need to be modified before they get automated. And, and in the other case, essentially implementing a one-off process as opposed to trying to implement a framework that gives you an idea of, hey, I can adapt to the changes that are gonna come, that is necessarily gonna come into the process. And when the changes do occur and something breaks, I'll have a hint from the system that tells me, hey, here's exactly where you go. And the way I've architected my whole, the, the whole architecture, I know that change, that minor change, will not have a, a ripple effect that runs across the whole environment. That's where a lot of this stuff came up. Yeah, I think the key thing here is, uh, as Roman said, it's, it's about 
embracement of change. And if you look at the, the old way of implementing, certainly back in the, the early sort of my early parts of my career with, with workflow and process management, you had these in kind of the fat pipe where the vast majority of the processes instance were exactly the same. And you spent probably you know eighty percent of your time dealing with the twenty percent of the exceptions to the process. Well, I think what, what people rapidly realized that as we move to this much more um, customer-driven world, that in fact, actually, the exception is not the exception. Everything is an exception. So what you ended up with was a, you know, a framework that was designed where a minority of cases were an exception, were different from everything else. And then the market shifted to where every every interaction with a customer i say it's like a snowflake in the sense that it has structure but every interaction is unique and therefore you need to create a framework that really is very robust and strong where it needs to be but also is very flexible where it needs to be i come from a military aviation background and one of the biggest advances you know that i've seen in since when i start first started out in aviation was the advent of composite materials which are extremely strong in certain directions, but also exhibit a high degree of flexibility. If you ever fly on an airplane today, even with one that's built using conventional materials, what you'll notice is when on the ground, you have the wings that are kind of drooping almost on the ground. In the air, they're actually, they're actually lifting up. They're lifting, they are literally lifting the plane, but at the same time, the wings themselves flex a huge amount. And actually, the amount of money in designing an aircraft, is so much is actually tied up in the the, the highly complex mathematics and, and the engineering into the wing design. That's really where the money is in a plane uh, design. And from a process and from an automation framework, that's where you want to be spending your time and money is creating an environment that is flexible, that is adaptable, that leverages technologies that embrace change rather than creating areas that are stress points that will break if, if, if you try and stress that process in a particular direction. That's a, that's a great a great example, Carl. And and clearly, as as we start to look at the marketplace, we're seeing this shift from a discrete set of processes to a much more holistic and ongoing approach that includes a broader set of stakeholders, right? That are starting to converge: the vendors, the partners, the customers. Now, based on on what you've seen at Episoft, what are some of the examples of the process automation um, areas and and how it can be applied to different departments? Well, like I mentioned before, I mean, we, we have a wide cross section of, of customers, but, you know, we have, you know, whether it's mortgage companies or, or companies in the HR space where you've got a lot of documents that need to be processed, that need to be classified, and the information needs to be extracted. So, you know, you look at something like um, Mountain West Financial, for example, they were dealing with uh, over 225 different document types. and and you know, basically a, a human being was required to, to basically look at every single document and determine what it is. That's a very inefficient way. And we were able to, to institute a mechanism where 95% of the documents were automatically identified. And that dramatically uh, decreased labor costs. You know, the classification time on a particular loan document or loan package was reduced from 45 minutes to under five minutes. So you can see the, the benefits that has in terms of how quickly you can turn around the closing of a loan, the ability to, to process things much more quickly and more accurately and, 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 and deliver significant benefits. You know, whether it's an HR department where you've got you know, an organization in France, for example, we have that, that onboards about 2,000 um, uh, new employees every year. Now, they're in the security industry, so you can imagine the due diligence that you have to go through in processing those documents is extremely uh, rigorous uh, and can be very labor intensive. So by be able, being able to automate those documents and, and be processed them more quickly, more accurately, with fewer resources, that has a dramatic input, not just in terms of cost saving, but you know, if you can't get somebody on board, then you can't get them to be productive in generating revenue. And you may end up losing business as a consequence because you don't have the, the human capital to deploy on behalf of your clients. And in this particular instance, a security company, if they don't have people that have gone through the background checks and so forth that are necessary, and they don't have the people on staff, they can't take do the jobs and they can't ultimately service their customers. 
completely agree. And I'll, I'll take I'll take Carl's examples and sort of extend it a little further, right? The, the HR component, hiring people, hiring the right set of people, onboarding them um, is, is a huge process in itself. Now that they're on board, um, they're facing what everybody else in the world's facing, right? Which is changing industry, which means their skills need to evolve. They're working on a set of processes that work a certain way, and they, they sort of interact with those processes and the systems a certain way. And some of them do it well, and others don't. Well, it's that underlying you know, uh, universe of data that tells you person A is falling short on a certain set of competencies and a certain, certain set of skills and needs to be retrained in something or trained in something new. It, it's, it's that level of input that to an individual, instead of this being viewed as a threat, it becomes such a huge advantage because what it's, selling, what it's saying to them is, if you fix this issue, your value in the organization is going up and up and up. Right. It, it's those little minutiae, the, the small bits of data that give you the indication of what's wrong with something. What are the specific sets of competencies or skills that work best with a process? What are a person's competencies and where are they falling short or where, where, where did the training fall short when they were being brought on board? It's all those things in an, in an HR context. Or the other case that we've come across was in this litigation processing industry where you did lean management. You, you had all of these uh, huge lawsuits, uh, all, the, all the class actions, where you had to determine whether somebody, you know, who said they got injured because of, let's say, ingesting a pharmaceutical or having something inserted, a, a stent in, you know, inserted in a, in a vein. And, and, you know, you had to figure out whether that claim was true or not. And you literally had to pull out their relevant history, actually the hospitals just send you all of the history and you had to cull out, you had to sort of filter out the relevant history from that and say, hey, is this really, does this, does this history truly, truly reflect, uh, you know, the fact that the person did, in, did take this pharmaceutical or did have this, this stent inserted or, and did they get injured? All of that, again, each, Pharmaceutical, each stent, each device inserted is different. The consequences are different. But the systems lying underneath, learning from the previous instances of where, where they've seen something in machine learning or creating a neural network and evolving from there to provide inputs on that. That's how important this is. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to the HR example because I think you know, we've obviously been talking about the benefits and uh, you know, uh, associated with doing this at a, at a big corporate level. But I think if organizations are really struggling, it can have really dire co consequences at a very personal level too. So I have a friend of mine who was applying for a job at a, at a financial institution as a financial advisor. And as part of that process, she had to go through a background check. And, uh, you know, she'd been, she was accepted uh, as part of their program to join their, their, uh, their training program to go through the various Series 7 training and, and various other financial advisor training that she had to do. And she was told that, you know, the, yes, we're going to offer you the position. You're going to start on this date. We're doing your background check. She was told, yeah, background check's fine. We can, we'll see you on Monday. On a Thursday afternoon, she was called up and was told, yeah, you know when we said we thought you had done your background check? It, it, it's not done. Uh, and we're going to have to rescind our offer. Now, she'd actually already resigned her position. Now, fortunately for her, she went back to her boss and said, you, you know, I said I quit. Um, actually, I don't want to quit. And that caused her a lot of pain and heartache. I mean, she ultimately was accepted back uh, with her employer. But still, the consequences for her were, and indeed could have been an awful lot worse, all because an organization wasn't processing things in a manner that was both transparent and, and in, a, in a manner that was, A, it took them too long, B, they, they thought they'd actually completed it and they hadn't. And the consequences for, for my friend were very, very severe. Uh, and you know that's just one example um, where, you know had they used technology, I, I should emphasize that this particular institution wasn't an Eversoft customer. Uh, and uh, and you know, perhaps if they had been, this, this whole situation would, could have been avoided. No, there are ramifications, both positive and negative, clearly, Carl, and that's a great example of that. Um, and, and so when we start to take a look at the, at the marketplace, it's clear that the solutions that are in place must evolve and continue to, to be innovative 
Uh, and that pace of innovation is going to increase rapidly over over the coming uh, over the coming years. Um, now, Raman, let me kind of direct this at you and, and get your thoughts on this. What are you seeing are some of the solutions that are incorporating this whole new notion of AI and machine learning into the organization and how it's being applied? Um, if, if you look at the solutions that are using this, it, again, they're, they're, they're all over the spectrum, right? Almost every industry. Um, and, um, we, used to talk, we used to talk about machine learning and AI in, in, term, in, the, in the terms of, hey, something's got to be extremely repeatable and have low amounts of variability for machine learning to do something about, to, to contribute something meaningful. No longer the case. The fact that you can build neural networks that can recognize patterns, that can store pattern data, that, can, that extends further out. Um, and, and the fact that you can also actually create you know, link those neural networks to user interfaces. So one of the big issues with most machine learning and AI solutions used to be training the model. Training a model for the results that emerge from the model to be statistically valid, to be relevant, right? Now, more and more what we're seeing folks do is they're creating a UI that, you know, that, that lets a human being interact with the, with the systems or the process that they are interacting with exactly in the manner they used to but feeding all of the actions that they took and all of the decisions that they made straight into a neural network, straight into machine learning. And that helps grow that underlying you know, knowledge base significantly. Now, to understand where this is headed, let me, let me step back and talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, most of the things that we've talked about here are discrete events or discrete transactions in processes. If you, if you look at a you know, close cousins in the, let's say, pharma industry or chemical manufacturing industry, what they have are what, what I would define as continuous flow processes. You have between pressure, temperature, catalysts being added, multiple parameters that are being measured by, that have been checked by sensors on, on, on in the manufacturing facility. And as something changes, there's an underlying algorithm that's checking these you know, every, every, every microsecond, every, every nanosecond, and then making minor adjustments to the pressure, the temperature, and how much of the, chem the base material was going in, how much of the catalyst was going in. In essence, that's the direction we are headed in. That's the uh, sort of almost a continuous flow. But again, even as I, as I say this, the mathematician in me says, even if you look at a curve, it's, it's a it's, it's, it's a set of conjoined straight lines, right? It all depends on how small that delta is. So in essence, that's the direction we're headed in. Really, really small you know, durations of time over which the transactions and the, and the actions taken, the decisions taken are measured. So when you look at it in the process context, uh, a, the direction within the process may change six times before it gets to the final direction and sort of settles and lands on the final solution. But in essence, it, it was flexible enough to twist and turn and get to that final solution. That's where we're headed. Now, AI and, and machine learning, what, what, you, what you're getting a lot of is the use of uh, multimodal neural networks, which means things that react to uh, textual characteristics with, with NLP uh, or speech, um, or speech text or text to speech, things that react to um, neural networks that, that capture information and store information associated with visual characteristics. And what, what we're seeing more and more of nowadays is a hybrid. It's not just the textual or the visual, it's a combination, which is in reality, if you look at most use cases, most reasonably complex use cases in the industry, one or the other of, of, of those characteristics, visual or textual, doesn't solve for it. And these Neural networks, these, these ba the bases of information are trained on, for example, the image net, or there, there's a taxonomy of language uh, terms in multiple languages, so that they, they're sort of language agnostic over time. These, these are sort of the directions that we're headed in. Yeah, and for, from Episoft's standpoint, I mean, we've, we've made extensive uh, usage of, of machine learning and other AI concepts. Uh, we have a number of patents relating to to that as well. So, you know, in our case, what we use AI and, and machine learning for is to is first of all the classification of a document. So, when we see a document for the first time, 
we need to understand well what is this document uh, and and you know like I mentioned with transacts for mortgage for example we've trained the system to recognize over um, 600 different types of documents and then once you know what a document is you're then looking for certain discrete elements within that document and, and where those things are located is not necessarily going to be you know, defined purely by the geographic coordinates of, of a particular field on a particular form. Those documents could occur on different, uh, those elements could appear on different pages, different locations on those pages. And we can build logic uh, uh, to train the system to look for certain key identifiers, certain interdependencies within the field of the forms in such a way that we can, regardless of the actual layout of the form, pull out the same information time and time again with a high degree of accuracy uh, to maximize the automation and efficiency of the manner in which those documents are processed. And just, just to add to that, and you know, just thinking about it in movie terms, you know, good old, the good old Terminator, right? It, it's the Skynet, and the Skynet is becoming self-aware, or almost, it almost seems like it, it's headed there. Yeah, bots teaching bots, that's, uh, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, and you're right. That's that's the reality of where we are today, uh, and that will that will definitely continue. Uh, maybe Carl, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for this slide, just to kind of provide a, a nice overview of of Episoft. Yeah, Episoft's uh, been around since 2010 and was founded by our CEO Ike Cavus. And uh, we have over 700 customers in 50 countries, and uh, we're growing very rapidly at the moment. Um, we have a lot of partnerships with uh, companies that are real leaders in their field. So when you, you think about terms like RP, RPA, for example, we work with the likes of UiPath, Blue Prism, in the ECM space and content space. We work with people like Alfresco and, and Box, uh, in the BPM space, people like K2, Nintex, uh, and also other, other providers in, in spaces like ERP, like Infor, for example. So. It's a really a reflection of what I was talking about right at the beginning, where you know at the technology that we provide is less and less becoming something that's implemented as a standalone uh, piece of technology, but more importantly integrated with whatever particular um, component uh, as part of a much bigger whole solution that's targeting the operations of an, uh, of the various customers that we have across the wide variety of vertical and horizontal markets that we operate in. Appreciate the overview, Carl. Uh, just as we come to the, to the tail end of the, uh, uh, the, the conversation today, and, and thank both you, Carl and Raman, for your insights and your industry expertise here. Clearly, there's a lot going on in this space. The, uh, the opportunities continue to evolve, and organizations in the complexity that we're seeing are going to continue to need guidance, continue to need uh, access to, to thought leaders in the space like yourselves. Um, just a quick reminder of some of the upcoming automation events uh, being sponsored by ERPA. We've got our Automation Innovation Conference that's uh, targeted at, uh, uh, in Medellin, Colombia on October the 11th. Uh, the uh, Automation Innovation Conference that's set for London is on November 6th. And finally, we end the year with the Automation Innovation Conference uh, in New York on November 29th and 30th. Um, so appreciate everybody's time today and uh, look forward to the next opportunity to share some ideas.